Better. Right, we are live. So, hello Louise. Hello Paula. So, um, today we're speaking to Louise Dickens and um, Louise is a businesswoman from Edinburgh and she runs a very successful, um, would you call it a holiday lettings? It's more than holiday lettings, isn't it? Yeah, we are, um, God, it's quite a controversial phrase at the moment in my industry, um, the way it's perceived by the world, but I describe us as a short-term letting agent. Short-term letting agent, yeah, and that's called Dickens. Yeah. And this summer, uh, Louise also started a second business linked to Dickens, which is Unlocked Tours. Is that, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Great. That's and, right. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see um, the websites. So this is Dickens. So this is um, all the lovely apartments that you can drool over. <laughs> and here's the Unlock Edinburgh. So um, just tell us about a couple of the, the sort of different tools that you, tours that you've got, Louise. Because they're a little bit different from the norm, aren't they? Um, yeah, what, what we're trying to do, I mean, in Edinburgh is a, is a city which is um, a city which people love to come and visit. So there is a huge tourism industry here. Um, but what, so, and there are lots of people doing tours of the old town and taking people to Edinburgh Castle. And there's a massive demand for that. It's a really significant uh, business here in Edinburgh. But one of the things that we wanted to do was actually about the, the, the word unlock, unlock tours. We wanted to get people, quite often these, the, the tours that are taking place are really large numbers of people. Yeah. 15 would be a small group, they call that a small group. Uh, so 30 people and, and especially in, in, well, certain areas of Edinburgh which have these small little closes, little, little, yeah. little lanes no way that you can uh, take uh, 30 people down one of those. So we're trying to, um, we're trying to get people off the, 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 the kind of, you know, the well-trodden path um, to discover some of the hidden gems of Edinburgh. But also what feels really important is we're trying to, um, we're trying to create tours which are as interesting for Edinburgh locals as for mm. visitors to the city. And I think that is essentially our unique um, selling point. And one of the um, really exciting, everything about this business does excite me actually. So <laughs> that, feels, uh, that feels good. Um, and what we're trying to do um, over the, uh, over what, what I'm building up over the winter is we want to have introduced the concept of the, uh, the unlocked Edinburgh, but the locked Edinburgh. So the things that are really special that you would never get to be able to do normally. So I am curating a group of uh, people who have, you know, who are really well known in their field, real experts in their field across art and whiskey and golf and Robert Burns and kilts and <laughs> foraging for, you know, yeah. foraging and flowers. So a real broad cross section. And you will be able to, it's the, it's the, what I'm trying to create is the, is the money can't buy, but in this case, it can buy you yeah. this opportunity. Um, so, for example, there's um, uh, somebody that has a, a gallery, a, a really well-known gallery in Edinburgh, and he is descended from, um, from a famous art, his um, a famous art movement in uh, Scotland, very well-known. And you would have the opportunity to go and meet him in his flat for a coffee. You would see some of their incredible art collection. Then you would go to their gallery, which is close by, and see. And he, you, you would be taken around the, um, the exhibition. And then you'll go up to one of the national galleries. And depending on your interest, he would take you around and, and yeah. explain some of the things. It's an incredibly special, intimate experience. Um, yeah, so that's what we're that's what we're curating over the winter, and we're we're going to be launching what's what's been um, fortunate about launching a business when you have another business running. Two things about it: some good, some bad. One, 
the good side is that um, I'm not absolutely sweating financially because I do have another business. So it's not it's not um, panic stations um, about getting this second business going. But um, the I suppose one of the negatives is that I don't I haven't been able to devote the amount of time I would if it was the only thing I was doing. Because it um, certainly isn't. But the well, I think one of the good things about it is um, that we've had the opportunity to to try because what you imagine is going to work isn't necessarily the thing and you've got to do it. And then I think especially in these early stages of a business, if you have the ability to be able to go a little slowly, to be able to try these mm. things and to recognize when you need to make changes, um, that is a luxury at an early stage of a business. And so I feel, um, I feel grateful for that. And we've always worked towards this summer being a let's see how it goes, let's try it out, let's, you know, and then with a view to um, launching in the, um, in March, we'll, we're gonna have a big launch event at the beginning of March next year, when we should then be all guns blazing for the season of 2019. Um, we were incredibly um, late to the market. We didn't launch the website till the end of July, which is too late um, this year, but, uh, but um, I don't know, I'm sure that most people will identify with the fact that the best laid plans, everything, well, certainly in my life, everything takes longer than I ever, oh, yeah. uh, than I ever allow. Um, and then life comes along and makes it even worse than your worst case scenarios. So, um, so we were, we have launched and, and uh, yes, it's, um, it's still for starting much more um it has been much more difficult than i thought it was going to be much more difficult to because it's like it's fascinating being at the really at starting a, a brand new business um that you, you, it's like a sort of stationary car and i need to get it moving and i'm absolutely sure that that i'm still even though it's been tough it's been a hard sell but as i said i haven't been absolutely going for it full pelt um but i um yes i'm absolutely certain that once i get it going that i am doing so i am doing the i'm i'm doing the right thing and we are going into the right industry i'm sure yeah. of that. so yeah. fundamentally positive <laughs> <laughs> yeah I can I can feel the strong sense of confidence about this yeah um, and I'm wondering so Dickens you started um, about 20 years ago so did you have that same sense of confidence then or was that a whole different thing um, I have I've just turned 50 um, and I have worked for myself since I was 23. Um, I set up, um, I went to Hong Kong after I left university and I trained for a couple of years to be, I'd, I'd done um, state management commercial property at university. And I um, was training to qualify as a chartered surveyor out in Hong Kong. Um, but I, really really uh, didn't like my boss <laughs> and um and i needed to keep going um just because it would have been mad to not have qualified somebody came along i mean obviously hong kong is a really entrepreneurial inspirational place for business um and somebody came along and said that they were going to do a art exhibition with um somebody from uh, that they knew from New York, she was American, and would I like to get involved in it? And I said, oh God, I'd really like to do that. I love art and um, it would be great to have something to focus on to help me get through this period until I can uh, sit my exams to qualify. So I did that. Um, in fact, that was a great and a terrible experience. Um, great because we created this amazing exhibition sold a huge amount of art. We um, had a charity night where we raised a hundred thousand US dollars in one night. And that was a long time ago, 25 years ago. Um, but the people that we were in business with, the gallery from America, um, took, 
people, they, we were too young a company to be able to process credit cards. So they processed all the credit cards and they never paid us anything. Uh -huh. They never paid us anything for our, our share of the, of the things or any, uh, any um, costs. Yeah. Uh, and we generated costs in, in, uh, in Hong Kong. So um, that was uh, hideous at the time. I mean, 23, imagine. Um, it was pretty strong experience, but it was a good experience for life about how, well, you know, how awful people can be, uh, behave in a terrible way. And I couldn't do anything. You know, they were in America, we were in Hong Kong. It was too complicated to do yeah. a, a, um, a kind of legal case against them. Um, so when I came back, so, and, and anyway, we did keep going because it had been a huge success. So I got a new business partner and I did three or four exhibitions and some really, um, some really uh, exciting ones. <laughs> because there was something about this, the, the, the confidence and exuberance of youth. So we did an exhibition with a gallery from, uh, from, London and they were sold French art and they were well connected and there was some uh, aristocrats who were amongst their painters but they could, the aristocrats could paint uh, there was lovely art um, and we always we tried to get it used to cost about 25,000 pounds to get these uh, exhibitions over to Hong Kong it was expensive to bring the art over and to um, have the exhibition set um, in a temporary space like a I guess it was a pop-up really. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you'd run them for about three days. Um, so we used to try and get it sponsored. And uh, Sally and I <laughs> sat down and said, and we said, oh, like, let's try and write down a list of, of French companies that we know. Oh, you know, Celine, uh, Louis Vuitton, blah, blah, Hermes. So we wrote down this list of, of companies and in those days, it was before um, computers. Um, so we had a typewriter, or I had to type, you know, it was like a type, not a, it was a type, it must have been a computer, but not in the way that they are now. You know, yeah. no, no digital photos or anything. So we sat down, it took me, I was terrible at typing. I still not, I can't touch type, but uh, really terrible in those days. So the thought of sitting down, even typing something is an absolute nightmare. Um, and I did that, and then we had to stick the photos of the art on with prick sticks. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just hilarious now to imagine that that was it. And one of the advantages of being a Westerner in Hong Kong in those days is you could get the name of the person that you needed to send this thing to. Hmm. So we sent them all off. And then one day the phone rang, like how did the phone even ring? I can't even imagine that scenario now because there were no mobiles or anything, but the phone rang. And it was the, um, I think he was called Pierre-Louis Dumas. Dumas certainly was his name. And he was the son of the Hermes family. And he had been sent to Hong Kong to cut his teeth in business. And he said, I really like your proposal. Can you please come and see me? <laughs> oh, yeah. I couldn't believe it. I mean, you can imagine. You couldn't believe it. So we got all... Uh, dolled up and went off to meet him in a, in a funny, you know, funny, you know, the office was not in a flash part of town. It was in a quite a, um, well, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't going to one of those sort of swanky offices. Went and met him and he said, I'd like to do it. So, <laughs> oh my God. I mean, it was really, really exciting. So, um, so we set up this exhibition. It was in a wonderful venue called the China Club in Hong Kong. And we um, and the the owner of the gallery wanted to serve champagne. We had the uh, the um, the chap who uh, no, sorry the French um, the French consul was going to open it. Hermes wanted to do the invitation in their beautiful um, uh, writing in their gorgeous brown ink. Um, and I had, there was a, the China Club, the, the general manager there was a guy called Johnny Lai, who I liked a lot, who liked each other. And, um, and I said to him, it's where we held all our exhibitions. And I said, and Hermes unbelievably gave us, we had a really good mailing list, but Hermes gave us a hard copy of their mailing list. Can you believe mm. it? That wouldn't be happening anymore. Um, 
And so, and we said to Johnny, what are we going to, um, how are we going to, um, uh, how many people are we going to do for the thing? He, we said, okay, let's agree 300 people. If more than that come, uh, it's my bad luck. If less than that come, it's your bad luck. Okay, fine. That was the deal. Anyway, on the night he came, <laughs> I was thinking, God, it's really busy in here. Wow. I don't know how many people are here. Johnny came to me and said, Louise, Louise, the deal is off. Um, there are 850 people here. Wow. Yeah. So we sold, and I think we sold everything. Um, I mean, there, there was a problem that night because it was actually too full to be able to see any uh, paintings. But when you have <laughs> created something like that and people, everyone looked at Sally and I, and the, the reality was we knew 20 people in the room, 20, 30 people in the room. Yeah. But fundamentally, we had created everything about that night. Yeah. We had done it. So um, it just showed, it was the most brilliant lesson in just having a go at something. Um, so uh, mm. when I came back to Edinburgh, that's for a very long story, but quite a good story, um, about when I came back to Edinburgh setting up, I came back, so I, 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 I had been in a relationship with somebody in Hong Kong, it ended, my mum had set up a, um, a, a property management business in, in Edinburgh and always had set up with a view, I didn't realise this when she did it, but she'd set it up with a view to me um, going and working with her. And um, she, and so I, that's what I did. I came back to Edinburgh at the time. And, um, and so we did this, I did this property management thing, but the Edinburgh Festival, I had, I had worked for a company that did festival lets uh, in the holidays from university. And I knew it was you know, a real thing. And it, I, I, I really loved the Edinburgh Festival mm. and I wanted to get involved in it. So that it felt like a no brainer to, um, to uh, try and get involved. So that first year I just made a few cold calls and, um, and really that was the start of that was the start of the business. And then I, it really was in those early days generated because it's such a, uh, you know, it, uh, if you've been, have you ever been to the festival? No, I've been to Edinburgh, but not the festival. No, no um, it's, such a, it's such a small world, you know, when mm -hmm. people are up here, that the, the, it is a phenomenal word of mouth um, arena, I guess. Yeah, I can imagine. And, um, and so, uh, I actually didn't do any advertising for years and years and I didn't need to do any quite interesting how it all, um, and now looking back, I'm not quite sure how, I mean, I think about all the ways that I'm speaking to the world now. Um, and in those days I didn't at all quite interesting. Um, but somehow, um, it, uh, it grew in that. And in those days it wasn't anywhere near as competitive as it is now. And I suppose that's the difference now. Or I mean, the world's just changed. I mean, it's just changed absolutely, completely. When I started the Dickens, there was no digital photographs or websites, and people used to come to me looking for flats. Um, it was a lot calmer, I think, in some ways, because people come and they say, I'm coming up from this day to this day. What do you need? I think one of my skills, my innate skills, is that I'm a really good matchmaker. And, um, and I... And I've always got a good, um, yeah, I, I, I'm good at matching people with what is going to suit them. Um, so they would call me and say that they needed something. And then I would go to my um, folders and look up all the flats I had. And then I would send, I'd write these long <laughs> emails, with these descriptions of all these homes. They never came to see them, never saw them. They yeah. said, oh, that's, that sounds great. That sounds great. I'll book that, please. Um, and in fact, what it did mean is that I was in complete control of the whole thing. It's like I had the kind of jigsaw puzzle and I could work mm. out where all the place, pieces were going to go. It was actually a lot easier. And people were calm because if I said I was going to help somebody, I helped them. Yeah. And everyone, knew, everyone felt calm about that, knew that. So, um, yeah, life was much simpler in many, many, yeah. <laughs> in many, many ways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was all those years ago. Uh, well, yeah, so what I'm hearing, so with both stories, starting Dickens and, and with your, your time in Hong Kong, yeah, what I'm hear, hearing, partly it's, it's having a go, you know, just as you said, with Dickens, you, you did some cold calling, um, you know, in, in Hong Kong, you, you sent all those, those letters out with the Pritstick pictures stuck on them, you just sent them to Hermes and everything and just did it. 
So partly I'm hearing that about the confidence um, and also tapping into networks. So on both occasions, you tap, well, you tapped into Hermes network over in um, Hong Kong. And also you said about, you know, the network around the, the fringe. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? Yes. Communities, yeah. fundamentally communities of people, because all of these things, you know, it's all people. <laughs> I think yeah. it's the thing which, the thing which is lost in business now sometimes is the fact that there are always people <laughs> making decisions. There's a person at the end of the phone that's looking mm. at your Instagram or, you know, it's, it, and, and, and actually communicating with people in real life. I mean, I, we now communicate um, with people through all my social media platforms and things, but communicate, communicating with people in real life has always, in my experience, be, been the best way to get things done. Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't second guess that. You don't think, oh, what do they mean by that in that email and da, 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 da. Yeah, you actually yeah, get it yeah, straight. You know, we all know how dangerous those are. Mm -hmm. So, um, last year I did a retreat in Verona and, and Louise was one of the um, participants on the retreat. And I remember you telling me a little bit about the business scene in Edinburgh whilst we were uh, away and we were comparing it to London. And in London, there are many, many um, opportunities for business women in particular to network. I mean, you could do something every lunchtime and every evening if you wanted to. And you were telling me how there isn't or wasn't then that that same sort of scenario so and I know a lot of business women in London that whole network has been really important to them with support and connections as we've been talking about so I mean what's it been like in, in Edinburgh building a business without that sort of scene that business networking scene um one thing I would say and it's quite interesting because I'm not sure if this is about me or about Edinburgh. I mean, I would, I would have imagined that if you, if you leave London, I wonder where else in the, in the UK, the whole of the UK, there would be a real scene of women running businesses. I mean, it's quite interesting. Oh, I, agree. I, 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 I would, I would wonder if, if, if it's, if it's a powerful thing anywhere. I mean, I, I, I it, only in big cities and I guess Edinburgh is a big city, but um, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think it, it would be something that you, in London, you can imagine it being on tap, but anyway, in other places. I think there are things that go on here, um, and maybe I haven't taken advantage of them. I mean, quite interesting. So last year, there was a, a, a women's mentoring scheme that was set up by the uh, Scottish, um, the uh, Scottish Enterprise Chamber of Commerce, various people got together to mentor women-led, women mentoring women in business. It was the first thing like that, an email came through, actually came through very similar time to the time I got your email about Verona. Um, and I had never been in a mentoring thing. I mean, I suppose that was one of the real things for me is I just always had to work it out for myself. Um, mm along the way, I, I, I worked for, um, I came back in 1995, uh, I worked for 11 years with my mum until she retired. Um, and she has been a definitely a, you know, a hugely important figure um, in my life and is inspirational in many ways. About business in, in about business in in some in some ways because she's really canny. She set up the business by herself, you know. Really, I mean, like there were no. My mum set up the business. They moved to Edinburgh in 1988, um, and my mum set up this property management business when there were nobody doing it. And at that point, she was 1988. She was in her late 40s. And there was nobody. I mean, you know, so that in, you know, so I suppose I had this, this, I've had, we've had a role model in the family of women setting things up. So, and my mum is a strong woman. So, so that's good. But I've always had to sort of work, yeah, I've always had to work things out for myself. Um, so this mentoring was um, brilliant. And in fact, I've had a fantastic, I'm, I'm, Go and it, weirdly, I'm going. I said, said earlier, but I'm going after this 
I'm having a lovely morning after this interview. I'm going to um, to a, a circle, a women's kind of circle that has been organised by my mentor, and it's the first thing like that I've been to in Edinburgh. So, so maybe it's getting better here. Um, but what that mentor, what the what the um, I think they really missed. So they set up this mentoring scheme, got people set up with mentors, but what they absolutely haven't nailed at all is is getting everybody together (laughs) so it's fine that we're all off on our different paths but actually you know you'd give your right arm to actually be in the room with all of those people you know to talk about you know life and how it's gone etc so so yeah and the other i mean yes it's funny i i am um i have got two young boys they're um six and eight and my life is really busy so I don't, um, yeah, I don't take much time out. My evenings feel precious um, mm. with my kids, so I don't take much time out to do um, networking events. But now when I, whenever I see, I've just recently met a really interesting lady who with a fascinating story lives and sold it, um, when she was really young, sold it very successfully and she's now the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce here and I met her recently and then made a kind of absolute point of following up um, with speaking to her so I suppose I'm 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 yeah I'm building it but yeah yeah. and I'm sure that people anyway be interesting to see what people's feelings are for business women around the country but I you know in in most times you just got to get on with it by yourself I mean yeah (laughs) watch some YouTube videos. That's true. That's true. Or the books. Yes. Yeah. Um, so thinking about um, Unlocked Hers that you've you just launched or just soft launched. Um, so when you launched your, your first business, well, your mum um, launched it, didn't she? But when, with, with Dickens, you, you had um, the, the success of what you did in, in Hong Kong, really, I suppose, to, to buoy you up and to give you that sense of self. Yeah affects it um so obviously with with a new business you've got 20 years of dickens being a success to to actually prove that you can do it um so have you noticed any difference in in your your confidence around the new business um i don't imagine there are many people that set up businesses in this way and i'm not certainly not suggesting this as a tip but i have never written a business plan (laughs) I've never written one. Yeah. So that part of me has never changed. Um, the, I'm, I suppose I am just more confident. You know, I am more confident because I'm, I know more about life. Um, I think one of the things that I, I, I like, I get, in, in, um, I get inspired, stimulated by learning new things. And what's been good about, um, I don't mind, um, I don't mind being challenged. I don't mind getting outside my comfort zone. Um, And what's been good about Unlock is that actually pretty much everything that I have learned is, has some sort of pertinence to Dickens as well. So uh, Mm -hmm. anything I'm doing on that feels like it has a, um, a pertinence, whether it is just absolutely looking at what a an, a completely up-to-date website needs to be and deliver and we're just um doing some i mean it's amazing isn't it you design a website now and you c- can't believe how fantastic it looks and then literally 18 months later yeah you can be thinking oh oh, oh yeah god look at yeah. that yeah so um so the kind of speed of of change and also as i um as i said earlier that at the very beginning there are real challenges um at the moment in the short-term letting world because um there is a sense you will have read about it in in all cities where people enjoy going there where there is tourism Mm. industry that there has been this massive growth in an airbnb or the Company's mm. name that is used nearly always, um, and they are, I guess, the market leaders. Um, and and there are 
there are real concerns, whether it's in Amsterdam or Berlin or New York or London or you know, Edinburgh, Venice, um, that, that this short-term letting world is having a detrimental impact on cities, um, mm. on, the, on the delicate microcosm of a city, this balance between business and 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 business and um and and tourists and and residents um and so and there are things you know that uh, throughout since i've had dickens there have been massive changes um there you know the dawn of the internet the suddenly that changed how you were um speaking to people i mean the the fundamental the foundation preparation is key the foundation of that business because it was rooted in real life relationships and me always making sure that I do a great job for people, a great job, great service. Um, in my world, uh, it's, it's really easy to offer great service in a sales environment, but I think you always really know if, you, if that company is genuinely interested in, yeah. in, in good service when you, have, when you find there's a problem. And that's the moment when you discover whether they really care about you or not. And we've always been really fantastic problem solvers. And, and people know in the kind of world of homes and flats, things do go wrong. So you want to be in the hands of somebody who is going to resolve it well. So, um, so, so I had this, so in the times of the kind of the changes to my business, I had this really strong foundation based on real life relationships with people yeah. that I had with forever but now what's going on in the business is stuff that is totally outside my control so if there are and i'm and i'm and i and i have absolute concerns i mean if i if i thought too much about it i could have absolute sleepless nights but but i have real concern that the that both the scottish government and the council will bring in legislation which is too strong or, or it's, it's too punitive um, that won't actually, well, yeah, that, that they will make, they will do something that will have a really negative impact. Um, because fundamentally, I think that a third of visitors coming to Edinburgh stay in self-catering accommodation. So if they suddenly, there's talk of limiting it to 90 days a year, for example, and I do get that there are, there needs to be some changes. Um, and there are instances where, the balance, um, the balance in the city is, is there is a real problem. I mean, there, are, there, are, there. Are, I walked past a, a staircase in the high street up by the kind of air, the old town, the mm. area by the castle the other day, and there were eleven lock boxes screwed onto the door frame for people going and doing short term lets, and that is right. too many. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. terrible. So, if there is anybody living in that place. Yeah, but also, but also, I mean, it's pretty awful for them. Like, who is this person in the staircase? Should they be here? You know, it's a, a very, very different thing because Edinburgh, I suppose, Edinburgh, quite unusually as a city, starting in the old town with these tall buildings, we've lived in flats. We've, we're a city that has lived in flats, which is relatively unusual. But so these kind of communities of a stairwell, it's about how these things are being. Um, and there are flats all over Edinburgh, how uh, these delicate, you know, communities are being changed. And um, so, yeah, so this stuff that's going on now is, is beyond control. And one of the reasons that I set up, um, I wanted to set up Unlock is that with two young children, uh, aged 50 years old, my youngest son just started school this summer, <laughs> that we're going to have to work forever. And um, And so it was about having another kind of leg on my table, diversifying the business um, and having another leg on the table. And also um, I do love, I love Dickens, but oh my God, it's complicated sometimes. There are so many working parts to it and, um, and things that can potentially, all these little detail, very detailed um, game, things that can go wrong. Um, whereas there is a blissful, simplicity maybe that's why i'm so excited by a lot that there is a blissful simplicity to the business because yeah. essentially you are just meeting people and showing them something completely wonderful like it's a it's an entirely positive experience yeah, yeah. um 
and and you're not you know yesterday i was at a flat where there's you know uh, in, in my dickens life last night went to a flat where there's scaffolding being put up outside and how on earth do I try to sell something you know there's these complications that I just am not going to face in a lot so there is something about that which uh, feels really attractive in this yeah. Uh, yeah. moment in my life because as as I don't know if you feel the same way but and I'm not certainly not saying that at 50 I feel in any way old or I feel like it's a wise patch of life a kind of golden mm. patch feel like um but and i have pretty good energy levels as a person i think um but definitely you think to yourself that like the 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 energy that i need to bring like the energy i need to bring to the summer to get us through the festival even though i know that it's all going to go like, everything that we experience tells me that we uh, that it will all be fine because I've, I've done it 20 times yeah I, you know, know what I'm doing but still there is this enormous energy that you have to bring to that and um and sometimes at the beginning of the summer it's interesting god it actually makes me feel emotional but oh this thing about being a mother Mm. and the summers is actually um it is challenging you can see you know this how do you square being a mother and working all summer like i have yeah. to so um so at the beginning of the summer holidays what that tapped into is how i feel i feel really like oh um so in a way, unlocked is sort of unlocking. Oh, God. <laughs> for you, um, unlocking. Um, yeah, oh, God. just something that is easier. You know, Dickens is hard. It's hard. The summer is really challenging. Um, and I always, I feel like that. In fact, and I, I said to somebody that I need to put a note in my diary for July next year to <laughs> remind myself that this is how I feel in July. Yeah, um, yeah but by august because i really love the festival so in fact by the time august comes along i'm absolutely all guns blazing but yeah yeah anyway challenges being a mother and a somebody oh, yeah. who works mother, businesswoman, yeah. two businesses yeah i've i'm yeah. there <laughs> i'm there yeah yeah so um, we were having a little chat before this this <clears throat> this interview about the whole concept of um, one's in a bitch, and as I uh, mentioned, uh, it's not about being mean, not about being nasty, or uh, putting down other people to make yourself feel better. It's about drawing on <clears throat> the strong woman inside, and you might feel her as a, a steely core or a fiery lioness or whatever and interestingly i got a little bit of a glimpse of her when you were talking about the flats and um how many you know people there were you know in, in the flats with the lock boxes and da 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 um yeah i got a little little flash of her there that sort of protective we've got to look after edinburgh and our people um so i just wanted to ask you about yeah, you're in a bitch, and, and how often do you have to access her, or in what way do you access her? Um, you definitely, I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think for our generation, the word bitch has pretty negative mm. connotations. It's not a great word. Um, whereas I understand that for young women, it means something different. It means like a fiery kind of lioness sort of thing. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, diff generational difference because bitch definitely wasn't a, wasn't a compliment uh, when yeah. I was growing up. But it is, you know, to run a business as a woman, you have to be strong. You have to be strong. You know, there's no doubt. I, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that, that I, 
I don't know. I've just always, well, I've always done it. So I don't know any difference. I've, you know, I've worked for myself since I was 23. So I don't know really what it's like to work for somebody else. But um, it is, it's about this. There are definitely times when, you know, men talk to me in a way that I think, mm, I'm really doubting that you'd be having this conversation in this way with another guy. Um, and mostly when I really need to bring my kind of like strength or like the bitch factor is really when I have got a tricky situation at work. Certainly those moments like, it, thank God, they don't happen very often. Uh, but, and if they're going to happen, um, they normally happen at something during the Edinburgh Festival where things might go legal. Mm. And and I, and I have to, uh, and it's about, and it's, it's always about, I really do pick my fights because we are very good. If we've made a mistake, we'll hold our hands up and, um, and admit to that. Yeah. But when something feels really unjust, then uh, in some ways it brings out the best in me, actually. And so, so sometimes this like inner, <laughs> inner lioness, uh, you know, bitch, how are you going to describe it, is sometimes the best in me because I will absolutely fight for our corner stroke, um, you know, whatever that thing is, or, or, or just, you know, if people really, you know, are, have brought some action against you that feels completely you know, unjust, then I will fight for that. So, um, but I was saying I wouldn't, you know, this sensation with, with uh, we said just quickly before this interview started, that I wouldn't necessarily want that feeling to be going on all the time no. <laughs> in the yeah. office, because mostly for me, it comes out at that moment when I need to like, you know, pull myself up by the bootstraps and, mm -hmm. and really face something. Um, there are times with, you know, with staff can be really complicated. You know, people can be, uh, are the best thing about business and the worst, you know, absolutely in with, with all of those, um, you know, uh, all of those factors along the way. And sometimes you have to be, you have to, you know, you have, again, you have to, you know, that lioness thing, you have to bring it out sometimes in a, in a work situation, in, in staff situations, when it would be much easier to just, you know, to not face the thing that you need to face. Um, yeah, and then I said, I'm, I have got this, I am, my, my, my maiden name is Louise Dickens, Dickens is the name of my business, so I am known as Louise Dickens at work, but in fact, I really am Louise Brooke, my married name. <laughs> and my, the kind of lioness thing that you feel for your kids, yeah, it's a different. It's a different feeling to the the, the you know how how uh, you know the the feeling that you have at work. But in terms of, um, I'm not scared to say it how it is in in the moments when I feel it's really important. Not you know mm. all the time. But in the moments when it feels like that's important, I'm somebody who will stick their head above the parapet and um, be. Um, what is the uh, disruptor? Actually, I, yeah. I'm not scared to disrupt if that is what feels, if it feels I'm going to pick my fights, not for the sake of it <laughs> every day, but I will, I, in the moments when I feel like it's appropriate, I will disrupt. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I suppose that is, you know, it's, it's there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The inner bitch. <laughs> she's there. She's there. <laughs> so finally, because I know you have a, um, your, your, your circle of businesswomen to uh, head off to. So if someone was watching this and they were in the early stages of starting their own business, what piece of confidence related advice would you give them? You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself and what you're doing. I, I, I've only ever gone into business with businesses that I understand and love, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and that feels really important service. It's, it's essential. It's essential nurturing these real life relationships. I think these days 
so much is done online or in a faceless way feels really important. And being authentic, I think that is, has probably never been more important yeah. um, because there's just so much fakeness out there. I don't want to sound like Donald Trump. <laughs> but there is, there is a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of inauthentic behavior out there. And, yeah. and I think that if you, um, if you, because also when you do speak the truth, people know they can trust you. Fundamentally, it's quite a, it's a thing because people know if people, if you know, yeah, it, 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 it allows trust and trust is the other massive, um, massively important area. Trust, um, trusting your brand and, and building up that sense of trust. And actually in my experiences that being honest um, is a good way to do that. Yeah. So my tip. Yeah, now that's so true. I was interviewing somebody the other day and um, she mentioned, yes, confidence in yourself is one thing, but people, other people have to have confidence in you too. Yeah. So yeah, the trust bit is is um, yeah really crucial to that. Well, thank you, Louise. Um, Thanks. So, uh, well, we've gone on for a while, haven't we? Long I know long. it's been yes. really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we would. I just knew we'd get. Well, well, I, the funny thing is, for everyone else, is in my moment of having tears there that I wasn't expecting. But when Paula and I were on our retreat last year, I cried nearly every day. So I suppose it was going to come out at some point. <laughs> Just me. <laughs> wow, I was being totally authentic. There's nothing. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so I'll stop recording now. But thank you, Louise.